Hi, this is Sally Morgan, physical therapist, craniosacral therapist, and Tellington T touch practitioner for animals and people. And this is Tristan, he's a corgi, and this is an episode of Conversations with a Corgi. So, I am on the board of the Northampton SPCA. In fact, I'm vice president, which luckily seems more an honorary thing than something I have to do work, you know, like uh, organizing the meetings or taking notes. However, my role has actually increased quite a bit with this organization since I became vice president a couple years ago. And one of the things that's come to our attention lately is someone looking for financial assistance with their therapy dog process. And that's what we do. We provide money for spay neuter. Um, if someone's dog needs to be cared for while they are having a medical procedure for several days, we help with things like that. Um, initially, it was really just for spay neuter, but now we've branched out to include, you know, helping uh, rescued cats um, get spay and neutered uh, at the vet and then return to a, a, a rescue cat colony or something like that. So this uh, person wrote us a really long, very sweet letter talking about how they would like to put their dog into work as a therapy dog. And one of the things that I started to think about listening to this and thinking about the whole situation is that we don't recognize enough stress in therapy dogs. I have had therapy dogs for over 30 years. I have helped people train lots of therapy dogs. I have worked with different organizations with therapy dogs. I have been aware of dogs used in therapy and assisting in emotional and physical therapy sessions for decades. And I've got to tell you, people to this day do not recognize signs of stress in therapy dogs and in dogs in general. Um, when I took a minute to Google this, I was shocked to find, and this is fairly recent, something in psychology today um, that a person wrote maybe a year, within the last year, saying that they did some study and they found no signs of stress in therapy dogs. <clears throat> and that, you know, yes, it's beneficial for the people and that the dogs are not stressed. Well, of course, their study was based on dogs that are working in uh, psychology sessions, I believe. Um, and they were also looking at dogs who have been therapy dogs for a number of years. Um, maybe the dogs are older, but it's so important to realize that your dog may have not been stressed in therapy sessions for years and then you get a rabies shot implicating that <laughs> and now your dog has problems so you need to be aware of these problems and not just assume your dog's going to be fine his whole life sometimes when they get older and have arthritis oh kitty <laughs> um, uh, they are no longer suitable as therapy dogs maybe with small children but they might be fine in a reading program so you need to really constantly reassess how your dog is doing as a therapy dog and of course I looked at some vet sites about signs of stress in dogs and you know they have like the big five but not those subtle things that you have to absolutely be aware of if you have a therapy dog or even a service dog that you are working with who is going out into like a mall. You need to know what your dog needs so that you are able to help him do the best he can in that situation. And so this applies to therapy dogs, but also to your own dog, no matter where you're going, if you're taking him camping um, or to a hotel for the weekend as you go on vacation, you need to recognize signs of stress in your dog. So the big five that you know vets talk about are of course digestive upset, diarrhea, constipation, more frequently needing to go to the bathroom, and of course, that can often be related to water in a new environment um, and prolonged stress and intense stress. Um, loss of appetite, that's a big sign of stress. And we see that in T-Touch classes all the time where we have dogs that are um, fearful of other dogs and they won't take a treat when they see another dog within a certain range. So that loss of appetite can be uh, a, a situation like that or it can be profound over days if your dog is living in a high stress environment. For instance, um, people getting a divorce and there's a lot of fighting in the house and a lot of stress and a lot of tension may find a dog not eating in that home, especially if the dog is connected to one of the people involved. Isolation, if your dog is hiding a lot, spending time not in the room with you and the family or the other pets, another sign that your dog is stressed. And in that case, it's more often a result of them not feeling good, maybe having arthritis, um, maybe having some digestive upset, maybe 
having an incident, maybe one of the kids was too rough with the dog and now he's hiding. So that's another sign that your dog is not doing well. Um, also, just like with people, a sign of stress is increased sleeping um, and also general lethargy. That's a sign of depression in humans and the same can be true in dogs. Now, of course, as dogs age, they sleep more as they adjust to our stupid schedules that we impose on them and we're at work all the time and then we come home, we're functional for three hours and then we're asleep again. A lot of dogs sleep a lot and it might not necessarily be their choice. Um, plenty of studies have been done in places where dogs are let out in the morning and they roam around the town for nine or ten hours with other dogs and have a little round where they go to the butcher and get some cast offs and, you know, have a nice dog day out. Um, and those dogs obviously are going to sleep less than your dog that's locked in your house all day while you're at work. And then aggression towards people and dogs. Any change in behavior that's big like that is a sign that your dog is stressed. For instance, again, when we're at a T-Touch training with a lot of new dogs in a room together for the first time, they haven't established like where they're gonna be sitting for the week, maybe their parents haven't set up their crates yet, maybe the dog doesn't feel safe in a crate, but during that time, we can see dogs being a little more snappy, a little more wary, a little bit more nervous with new people. And of course, with the miracle of T-Touch and several days of a regular kind of um, training and class, the dogs calm right down. But certainly in a bigger situation, um, for instance, I have done some, some PT sessions with dogs maybe in a hotel lobby and um, the dog is fine in the beginning of the session, but as his issues come up, for instance, maybe needing a chiropractic adjustment, that little tool makes a lot of noise. It can be really disconcerting for some dogs, even this one, um, and they may suddenly start to growl at strangers walking by. Not an ideal setting, but you know, when you have that space available, that's what you have to do. So better to treat the dog than not, but certainly, be aware of changes in their feelings about other people and other dogs. You know, maybe maybe they had a scary experience with just one person dressed a certain way or acting a certain way, and you probably didn't notice it, but now for that dog, every time they see a person in a floor length coat, they're nervous because that other person may have stepped on them or kicked them inadvertently or something like that. So you gotta be really aware of changes in your dog's um, general outlook towards dogs and people. And these are the five big things that vets talk about all the time. However, in my work and in anybody working with a therapy dog, you need to look at much more subtle signs than this. And certainly there are plenty of books and charts with signs of dog stress and anxiety, pictures of like tails up and things like that. But some of the more subtle things that you might not notice are like increased panting, um, and also that can be, you know, like Tristan does this quite a bit when we're at work. If I'm getting ready to go to lunch and he's nervous cause I'm going to be leaving him, he gets up and he starts panning and people are like, Oh, the dog's hot. Should we put the fan on? No, he's nervous cause his job, cause he's a service dog is take care of me and I'm leaving the room without him. And he does not know what's going to happen. So panting is a big one. Um, also standing in a stiff way, whining. I have a whole list I made here. Crying, um, licking the lips, trembling. We had a fire alarm at work yesterday and darn if it didn't happen a minute after the lunch break started, which meant that I was walking down the hall, thank God I wasn't in the ladies room, uh, going to lunch and Tristan was alone in the room because that's where he spends his lunch hour because we've got too many people with dog issues for him to go to the lunch room. So anyway, um, at that moment, the alarm sounded, it's really loud. It's super loud. There's flashing lights and he is traumatized. So I put down my cup and my lunch and I just literally run back to the room to grab him where one of my coworkers had already untangled him from the chair where he was um, attached because he was circling in anxiety. <laughs> and I picked him up because I knew, even though it's good to keep all four feet on the ground when you're stressed, I knew that picking him up would get him close to me and he would feel safe and I could get him out of the building a lot more quickly with a crowd of people carrying him than walking him. And as soon as I put him down, he pooped. That's how stressed he was. He was scared, literally scared to death in that moment. Well, not death, but you know, really scared. 
And then when I walked him across the parking lot, of course, the outside of the building is loud too, and there's a crowd of people and he needs to pee. And I'm trying to find a bush that's in the zone we're supposed to go in for him to pee. Um, and at, after that, he was trembling. His hind legs were shaking and so were his front legs. He was really, really scared. If I am at a therapy visit or anywhere with my dog and I see this happening, all else has to stop and that dog has got to be taken care of. You cannot ask a dog who is that afraid to continue to do anything except take care of himself. Imagine yourself in that situation. I mean, this is how I feel when I see a, you know what, <clears throat> snake in the yard. So trembling is a big one. Hiding, um, if your dog is trying to get behind you or behind your bags. Um, and I, <clears throat> I was with a dog in a school system once and it was a new dog to the room and the kids were little and they were asked to line up and pet the dog one at a time, but they really couldn't do that because they were little and they're not good at following directions. And the dog was cowering under a desk and luckily super friendly, so not biting any kids, but definitely hiding, definitely overwhelmed. The better thing would be, have been to take that dog out of the classroom and have the door between the kids and the dog so that each kid could come and greet the dog one at a time and to do that in groups of like six and then do it another time in the day and another time in the day. It's a lot to ask a dog to have to meet 10 to 20 new strangers who are six years old all at once. So hiding. Um, loss of bowel and bladder function, as I said, Tristan, that's usually his walkies time anyway, is the lunch break, and he's usually been holding it all morning, and for me to have to carry him outside and have him go immediately, and of course, then I got to clean it up, and people are trying to leave the building, and they're trying to time us, and hold up numbers, and tech, you know, check protocol, but you know what? In that moment, there's not a fire. It's a fire drill. My dog is my number one priority. We've had like three fire drills since I've been there. And typically I know about it and it's not at the moment of lunch break and I am with him and I am able to take care of him. And it's been fine. I actually have cotton in my bag to stuff in his ears to help. Um, or I just use the Kleenexes we're provided with at work. So um, yesterday was very exceptional. Some of the other things that you can see signs of stress with your dog is tail wagging. And we see this all the time in T-Touch classes. And I have a pit lab mix now that I see here. And his people think he's happy because his tail's wagging all the time. But his tail is wagging because he's stressed. It's a coping mechanism. He is overwhelmed. So one of the things we do with T-Touch is just quiet the tail. And you can change the whole dog excuse you, Biscuit, by quieting the tail. And so watching your dog's tail when you're doing therapy visits is really important because if he is wagging excessively, then that dog is not happy. He is stressed and he is trying his best to calm himself by wagging his tail. And, um, you know, we all think tail wagging means the dog's happy. Wrong. Tail wagging means a lot of things. It can mean the dog's happy. It can mean he's stressed. It can mean he's confused, depending on how he's wagging, the quality of the wagging, what position his tail's in. So really important to watch your dog's tail, of course. And then the eyes. If you see the whites of your dog's eyes, obviously he's stressed. Yesterday at the fire drill, Tristan's eyes were bugging out and he was really stressed. But even just kind of a hard stare, not looking at something, but through things, that's another subtle sign that your dog is getting stressed. And of course, one of the most important things um, that I thought of is breathing. If your dog is breathing, see how he just licked and yawned? He's, he's relaxing himself by licking and yawning and he's panting a little because I'm very hot because I just had a shower and he's on my lap and it's hot in here. <laughs> so um, anyway, you know, just little things like um, the way your dog is staring and whether or not he's breathing can help you manage your dog and make him a better therapy dog. If you see that he's stressed and you're able to intervene early on with just something like holding his breath, then you can help your dog build up an ability to tolerate more and more situations. And you have to know about this to work with a therapy dog or a cat or a bunny, any animal that you work with doing therapy. Um, another sign of stress in dogs is their ears back, just like with horses, like his ears are right now. See how he just put, put them back? That's a sign that of stress. Right now it's a sign he wants me to pet him. But when they put their ears like that, that's also a sign that they're concerned. It's almost like a self-protection thing, like almost an attempt to curl up in a ball. Um, and of course we have the barking and the whining and 
Some of the other things are when they curl their lips just a little bit. There's the err, uh, like this. There's the fierce corgi look, but there's also, can you guys see this a little bit? Just when they pull their lips back and they make like a tight upper lip, that's a sign they're holding in their Are we back? Okay, we're having tremendous rain here. You know, we're getting the, the ends of Florence. So if they're holding their lips back like this, they're scared. So that's another sign of stress. And of course, any kind of extra shedding. A lot of people will report, oh, my mother was so funny when this was happening. A, schnauzers aren't supposed to shed, but they do. But when she had one of her young schnauzers, she used to take her for rides in the car to get her used to being in the car because they got to take her to the groomer and to my sisters and stuff. And boy, they would just look like somebody had shaken the schnauzer out and left schnauzer feathers all over the back of the car. So a lot of dogs, you'll notice excess shedding. And one of the typical places to see that is when you take them for a car ride, if they're not happy in the car, there'll be piles of hair everywhere, more than normally what you'd find around your house. So a lot of dogs, if you take them to a therapy session and they're super stressed and you drive them home and there's piles of hair in the car, that means that session was too hard for your dog. It was stressful for him. I don't think the lady that wrote for psychology today was looking at things like excessive shedding. Drooling. This is so important. Of course, if you have a drooly breed that's doing therapy work, like maybe a Newfie or St. Bernard or some of the other boxers are pretty drooly. Um, if they drool excessively, then they are not happy. They're nervous. So really pay attention. Also, by the way, if you have a drooly breed and you're bringing them for therapy work, make sure you have not only a towel, but a bib on the dog to wipe the drool. A, it's kind of cute and people warm up to it. And B, um, some people are concerned about drool. And if you, they see that you're managing the drool, they'll have a much more um, happy uh, visit with your dog. So drooling is the thing to keep an eye on. Itching, if your dog is itching a lot, um, scratching, maybe licking their privates, that's another coping mechanism that means that they are stressed. So keep an eye on these things. Yawning. Now, yawning and lip licking are also things that dogs do to cope with stress. Yeah, one of her dogs pukes in the car. <laughs> That's another sign of stress. So, um, ear work, T-touch ear works. <laughs> You've got to um, be able to do that. Just put her in the car and do ear work without it moving. Uh, start the engine and be doing the ear and mouth work until she can be in the car with it stationary or running and not puke. And then start taking her for... Uh, rides like literally to the end of the driveway until she can handle it. Um, so drooling, shedding, uh, vomiting is another sign of stress. Um, another thing that you should really keep um, an eye on are things like, um, what was I going to say? Itching, scratching, uh, staring. Oh, staring yourself or people staring at your dog. So certainly there's research now that gazing gently at your dog and you gazing gently at him releases serotonin and oxytocin, which are good hormones in your body and his body. However, that's your dog looking at you and you looking at him in a loving way. If you're in a nursing home where people have all kinds of dementia, their stare may not read as I love you to the dog. So it could be really difficult for people. Um, now, some of these dementia disorders, the person's kind of staring vacantly. That's fine. That's not likely to stress out your dog. But also, likewise, if you are staring at your dog saying, don't you dare, keep calm, you know, that kind of thing, that's also going to create stress in your dog. So really be aware of the people and where and how they're looking at your dog, including yourself when you're doing a therapy visit. So um, another thing to think about when you're working with your dog is your own situation. If you are stressed, if you are anxious, if you are running late, if you are nervous about your next visit, if you are trying to impress somebody, if you want to reach a particular person and you have an agenda, any of these things that are going on in your mind can create stress in your dog. One of the best therapy dogs I know, Golden Retriever, he's with... Uh, uh, a veteran and he does all of these high stress interventions and things this dog is a great dog but part of it is the wonderful attitude of his person that guy is smiling and happy and relaxed and if he's late or if he forgot something he does not care 
He is just happy to be with his dog and happy to share that experience with other people. And that's the kind of chill person you have to be to be the best person you can be with a therapy dog. He brings this dog to hospitals and nursing homes and veterans facilities. And he works with people in high stress in emergency relief situations. And in fact, they may be even going down to North Carolina pretty soon. And he has lots of cute costumes for the dog, which in a way I recommend because I know for my own benefit, um, and I've worked with dogs with children and adults, and even the adults love the costumes on the dogs. And it preoccupies my brain. I'm thinking, are they going to think he's cuter in this outfit or that outfit? So it keeps me more chill about where I'm going. So I think the outfits are nice. And plus this guy, because he's in a veterans facility, he's got a Marine thing for his dog. He's got a Navy thing for his dog. He's got an Army thing for his dog. And he never tells anybody which branch of service he was in. Because that's like a little ongoing joke. Like who's tougher? You know, who did more? Who's, you know, whatever. So he um, likes to ask the guy, you know, he says always thanks him for the service. The first thing he does. And then he's like, what? branch were you in of the service and the guy will say blah 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 and he'll pull a hat or a scarf or a jacket out of the bag and say look my dog is also a marine and the guys just light up so having something to keep you happy can, and also to uplift the attitude of the people you're visiting no matter where they're at these guys can have profound dementia and this guy is so good at meeting them where they're at which is a t-touch term we use all the time that keeps him calm, keeps people calm, keeps his dog calm. So anyway, really, really important for you to be calm and happy when you go to do visits with your dog. A lot of people get really serious, like, oh, I'm going into this dementia unit and I'm really gonna make a difference and I'm gonna have some guy talk today who hasn't talked in six years. Maybe, maybe not. Better to just go in there and not have a plan or any kind of thing in the back of your mind you know, people's personal egos get really built up by the fact that that guy in room nine talked today and he hasn't talked in a month because the dog was there. You know what? That's between him and the dog. That's not about you. You don't need to get too excited about that. I mean, it is exciting and you can share it when you come home, but really important that you um, go in there with no agenda and with a tiny ego yourself because it really is about your dog and the person. So you need to be calm and be on the lookout for drooling, hair loss, staring eyes, stiff posture, wagging tail, licking lips, yawning. And if your dog is starting to hold his breath, let alone all these other bigger things that can be happening. So one of the things you can do if you notice like your dog is starting to get nervous, you can yawn. You can fake yawn. Yawning <sighs> is a release sign. And actually, they've done studies, the quicker you yawn after someone else yawns, the more compassionate and empathetic you are. So start noticing if somebody yawns in a room, who are the first people to yawn? Those are the people I want to hang out with because they are um, confident in themselves and concerned for others. So I look for that yawning. But your dog being perfect dogs will yawn if you yawn. Also, if you start going that helps relax your dog too because you look like you're getting ready to eat. And again, that ties in with that idea of the parasympathetic nervous system, which is rest, digest, as opposed to the sympathetic nervous system, which is stress. That doesn't make anybody feel good. My dog just held his breath when I did that just now and notice he's yawning to try to relieve the stress I put in him in a second of holding my breath and sitting erect. Um, Oh, what is this? This is important. It is, I heard that it is frustrating dressing dogs. Caesar did an episode where he says it intimidates them. Okay, we will not comment on my opinion of him. However, we will address this issue because it is important. And Linda has talked about this a lot, Linda Tellington. Dressing up your dog really depends on how your dog feels about it, just like people. You've got little kids that want to wear a princess outfit to school and carry a wand and wear a tiara. They don't care what people think. They're happy in their princess outfit. You've got other kids that only want to wear a certain t-shirt because it's like their friends and they want to fit in. So dogs are the same way. If people laugh at your dog, that is a big deal. How many of us like to be laughed at? Not any, probably. We like to laugh with. But if you're dressing up your dog with like a clown nose and a silly hat and your dog's trying to get it off, 
that dog is not happy and people will laugh at him and that is not respecting the dog. So you've got to put costumes on him that show respect for the dog. So this guy's got the routine with his dog wearing different pieces of military gear for whatever branch of service he wants to impress the person with. The dog is used to this. The dog knows how to give a paw, which he does right after that. And it's part of his routine. The other thing is the guy's not putting things on the dog that are restricting him. I, I really, speaking so clearly to this situation, there was a dog I saw at a parade who the kids had dressed up in like their cast off t-shirts and mom's old boas around his neck. It was blistering hot. The dog was a senior. That dumb t-shirt was hanging down under his tummy. Every step he took, his back legs were getting caught in it. Then it was strangling him. Bad situation, not good to dress your dog stupidly like that. And he couldn't pee because if he peed, he'd pee on his shirt, which most dogs are tidy and don't want to do that. And then he'd have to drag the pee around. And these people were completely oblivious. They had a lot of kids. The dog was the last thing on their mind. And that dog was really suffering, really disrespected. I took the t-shirt off of the dog and I said, I think it's too hot for your dog to wear this. And they were like, oh, thanks. So yes, what you put on them really matters. Tristan has been dressing up since he was a wee thing. He thinks dressing up is fun. He knows that he's going to only have that costume on for a couple of minutes. Mommy takes a bunch of pictures and then we're done. But there are certainly plenty of dogs, including some of my sisters, and she's got a lot of them. Some of them like to wear costumes, some of them don't. And some of hers, they are not going to want to wear a costume at all. So, you know, just getting a little bow in their ear is plenty for them. And my friends, Dachshunds. They don't like to wear costumes either. They don't even like to wear their coats, but it's so cold where they live and their dachshunds, they have to have a coat. So notice what your dog likes and tolerates. You know, Tristan's got a variety of hats. He's really good at wearing a hat. So yes, I, I think that uh, making fun of a dog and dressing up a dog for your benefit, not a good idea. But if you're doing it in a way that's respectful for the dog, and you know, think about would I wanna wear that thing? How would I feel in this situation? And that's always going to give you an answer because your dog's very tied into you. And if you're going to feel bad with a big clown nose and bright pink hair and some kind of baggy dress, let's not be putting that on your dog. You know, Tristan and I dress up together. We both wear kilts and we do our dog dancing routine or we both wear little snowflake outfits. And he likes being dressed up because He's done it since he was a baby and I get excited about it and nobody laughs at him. Everybody always says, aw, and how cute, but nobody's laughing at him. And there's a big difference between a whole room going, aw, how cute, and people laughing. And my friend Karen, who does dancing with her dogs, can tell you that it is really true. Um, and what she puts on her dogs when she's going to nursing homes and schools really matters um, because it's going to change people's feeling in the room and that's going to affect your dog and that's going to affect his performance and his ability to do his job which goes for therapy dogs too so good question thank you for bringing that up um, because it really does matter what you're putting on your dog i mean we have a whole ton of these kinds of things and most dogs don't mind wearing these things thank god they invented them see tristan's like yeah whatever i got something around my neck with pink roses and you know, he's a boy, but he wears pink roses. So don't be too attached to gender roles when you're putting things on your dog because he looks cute in his pink roses. And uh, you know, in the springtime, we like to wear them. So thanks for joining us for this episode. I keep losing my voice. I don't really know what's going on here. Um, this episode of Conversations with a Corgi, where we looked at some of the signs of stress that you might see in a therapy dog in particular, but your dog as well. And then some of the things that we're going to talk about in the next coming days are causes of stress, what's going on that's causing your dog to be stressed, and ways to manage that stress. And of course, the number one thing, T-touch. T-touch yourself, T-touch the dog, T-touch the person causing the stress. You need to know T-touch to take your dog into stressful situations because it's so important. Just like that guy that's throwing up in the car, ear work, really helpful. Go back to the early episodes of Conversations with a Corgi on YouTube, like number 30, and look up the ear work and the mouth work. And that's really helpful for dogs that are sick in the car. So thanks for joining us today. I'm meeting with someone who's uh, looking at getting his dog certified as a therapy dog on Thursday. So I may have a lot to say after that. <laughs> thanks for joining us. Have a great day. 
T-Touch is Tellington T-Touch. Linda Tellington developed it. It is a system of working with animals um, using body work and ground exercises. Um, and it really changes behavior, emotions, um, and really learnability, teachability for the dog. Um, so go back and look at those early episodes of Conversations with a Corgi. There are about 50 on Tellington T-Touch. They have a website, ttouch.com. And I've been a T-Touch practitioner since the early 80s. I've worked with Linda for 30 years. Spent more than a year of my life with her in different classes. So um, T-Touch is a wonderful thing and it's a simple type of body work you can learn to do yourself. And of course, why would somebody like me take 50 classes? Because there are refinements. There is so much to know about T-Touch. It's an evolving thing. But definitely, Angel, go check it out um, on the early episodes of Conversations with Corky on YouTube. And um, they're, they're one of the, like, probably number 10 was what is T-Touch. So, and they just keep going from there. There's a good 50 of them on T-Touch. So thanks for joining us. And I will be back on Thursday um, for another episode. And then uh, I will be driving to New Jersey on Friday. And I'll be in New Jersey Saturday and Sunday. So I don't know what's going on with my schedule. We'll try to get some episodes in here. And I do have a lot to say about stress and dogs. So um, we'll probably have a few episodes on that. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day. Stay out of the rain.